Coming up next, we celebrate a special singer who passed away just two years ago. Considered by the industry to be a one-hit wonder, but his one hit was much more than that simple label. It's charted three different times over the last 40 years, including hitting the Billboard Hot 100, the top 20, twice in the 80s, at the beginning and the end of the decade. Its singer and writer was a special soul who battled his demons and he won, inspiring so many along the way. I was able to interview him, fortunate to do so before he passed. It's definitely one of my most cherished sit downs ever. It's coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Uh, the whole reason that this channel exists is to honor artists and songs that have made a paramount difference in our lives. Uh, so please subscribe below to help us to do that. Now, this is a special episode of Professor of Rock. Two years ago, we lost a great human being. He happened to be a singer and a songwriter as well. He co-wrote and sang a hit that is a, a no doubt about a bottle lightning classic, Benny Mardonis. Oh, I, I was fortunate to get to know Benny in the years before he passed. Uh, he passed away after a brave fight with Parkinson's. I did a long raging interview with him about his career toward the end, you know, his ups and his downs, his legacy. And though some of the interview was released a few years back, I wanted to lead uh, with never before released footage, which makes up the majority of this interview, including his redemption after a long fight with addiction, as well as the compelling story about how he created the three time hit Into the Night. This is one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done, and I wanted to share it to keep Benny and his music at the forefront of our minds. He was such a great guy. Uh, he was a tender and humble soul, like I said. Into the Night is a bottle lightning Hall of Fame inductee, no question. It charted three different times, including twice in the 80s. It's one of the most played radio songs of all time. Benny also tells us about meeting some legendary songwriters and people who've long since passed, some great memories in here. If you were ever to see one of our interviews, uh, I think this would be the one. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. She's just 16 years old. Leave her. Well, Benny, I want to ask you about Into the Night, the story behind that. It's an amazing story about how that song came together. Because when it first came out, it was controversial because of the first line, obviously. But uh, I, I read the story about it because as a kid, I always loved the stories behind the songs. I'd hear the song and it would just, especially that song, and it just etched itself on my soul. And so when I finally heard that story, I was really amazed. Tell me about Into the Night. Well, Robert Tepper and I, I call him Bobby. But well, Bobby Tepper, and he also wrote the song from Rocky IV. Rocky IV. No Easy Way Out. Yeah. There's no easy way out. There's no we started writing together, and we were doing some songs, and I said, you want to go to Miami with me to make the record? And he was like, oh, that would be the best time of my life. I said, all right, well, we'll keep writing. And... There was a family in my apartment building. Their father was a set designer, a struggling set designer. And uh, there were two girls and a boy. The girl Heidi was 16 years old. Her sister was 17. Her brother was 15. I was sort of the local rock resident in the building, yeah. you know, from Thank God for Girls. The album, yep. You know, one day... They were, my doorbell rings and I open it up and the three of them are standing there and they're in tears. And it turns out the father just up and left. And apparently his ship had come in and instead of coming home and saying, we're moving out of the ghetto, uh, instead he took off with somebody from the chorus line and left, left, his, family. left his family destitute. Gosh. And I brought the kids in my apartment and I hugged them all. I said, it's all going to work out. It's going to work out. And I had no idea how it was going to work out, but I wanted to bring them comfort when, at the moment. And so I said, Heidi, I'm going to give you $50 a week to walk my basset hound, Zanke, 
every morning before school. And Sean, you come to my apartment after school every day. And I would give him like $20 to go get me a pack of cigarettes or a gallon of milk. And I had to let him keep the change. One morning, Robert and I were up all night being bad, trying to write a song. And all night we're struggling with dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And we worked on it for five hours and couldn't come up with an opening line that would really grab people. That would really grab people. And all of a sudden I hear the door turning and I go, oh my God, it's daylight. Cause I used to black out my windows. And in walks Heidi, dressed for school, mini skirt, stacked heels, 16 going on 21, you know? She said, have you been up all night? We were like, yes, we have been. <laughs> trying to write a song. She said, come on, Zanky. And she takes it and she said, I'll see you in about 20 minutes. And she left and Bobby went, oh Lord. I said, pal, she's just 16 years old, leave her alone. And I said, play that lick again. Dun, 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 dun. I went, she's just 16 years old, leave her alone, they say. Bobby, just keep doing that separated by fools who don't know what love is yet but i want you to know if i could fly in other words if things were different i'd pick you up and take you into the night and show you a love like you've never seen It's like having a dream, struggling set designer, where nobody has a heart. It's like having it all, ship came in, and watching it fall apart. And the lyric is about abandonment and about how he left and left the family destitute. And Into the Night turned in to be the song of 1980. I mean, it was played, it was hard to turn a channel in New York City and not find Into the Night playing. And so I was doing a live broadcast from the bottom line and Scott Muni called me and he said, Benny is, this girl real or is this something you made up? I said, this girl's real, she lives in my building. He said, would you bring her down to the bottom line? We'd like to put her on the air. And she went on the radio and she became so popular that she met the son of a real estate baron who built hotels in Puerto Rico and places like that. And she met, met him, they fell in love and eventually they got married. And she lived in a mansion in Puerto Rico, brought her mother over to live with her, wow. had the brother work for the husband's company, and everything turned out for the family, wonderful. And every Christmas I get a card that says, you changed my life. But actually, she changed my life because it, it was the substance I needed for that opening line. Then the rest just came out. We finished writing it. And I said, let's go down to Polydor and play it. So we jump in a car and we go down to Polydor and I jump up on Dickie Klein's desk and I brought Fred Hyen in, the president of Polydor, and we sang Into the Night. We called it She's Just 16 Years Old. They changed it to Into the Night, thank God. <laughs> we have a new song. So Bobby played acoustic guitar and I sang it. And... Freddie said, it's a good song, not a great song. And you have plenty of material, so not worry, but thanks for coming down. And we walked out, we got in the elevator and I went, <laughs> Bobby, he doesn't have a clue. This is a hit song. Oh yeah. And so we go down to Miami and we're in pre-production with the legendary Barry Moraz. We were teaching the band She's just 16 years old. And they were playing it, and Barry walks in and says, what is the song you're playing? I said, 
oh, it's a new song that Bobby and I wrote. But Freddie said, it's not a great song, it's a good song. He goes, that's your first single. So we cut a basic track on it, and they sent the basic track to Polydor Records. And I was staying at the Mutiny Hotel in Coconut Grove, and I get a phone call at like 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's Freddie Hine. He goes, this song is fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> Where did this come from? I said, that's the song we played for you last Tuesday. <laughs> it was dead silence. And I said, but we don't have to talk about that. And he goes, no, I think it's fantastic. Is there anything you need? I said, I'll look around and figure it out. <laughs> so I have a piece of paper and a picture on the album that says, please send us $35,000 for interdubbing. That was to buy drugs. There was, oh. no, there was no such thing as interdubbing. And down payment on a U-boat, I said, just as a dig, you know, to Freddie. Yeah. <laughs> and the song exploded. Here now with the number nine song of this week. I hope something rubs off on both of us. <laughs> Would you please welcome Benny Mardonis. Benny Mardonis. It freaked me out. Then people thought it, was, it became so controversial. It, I, I didn't even think about that. To me, it was just about this little girl losing her dad. And when radio got a letter sent it out by the record company explaining the story, they started playing it. And of course, it went through the roof and became a huge monster hit. One of the greatest vocals ever put down to record. I mean, I remember as a kid just thinking, how can somebody sing like that? And I know so many other people feel that way. This voice that came from ab up above, man, just a beautiful, just sprawling, heart-wrenching, I mean, I don't think there's ever been somebody that sang a song with that much emotion. One of the things in the song that I love so much is that you go into the first chorus and you grab one with, if I could fly, I'd pick you up and take you into the night. But when you go into the second verse, you're saying it's like having a dream where nobody has a heart. It's like having it all, watching it all fall apart. And I would wait to, and I would, and right there, you think you're gonna go into the chorus again because you're building that up. And I love how you take it, you, you kind of bring it there and then you go back to the verse and you do that again. I love that. And do it again. It's true. I wanted to tell the story. And if I would have went into the hook, it would have been too much. It was like a seductive sort of format to keep you wanting to hear more. And the song meant a lot to me. And I, and I remember like yesterday, the day I did the vocal. And I think it was the third take. Wow. And Barry said, you're good. And I said, well, maybe I can. He goes, you're good. <laughs> I said, okay. And what the vocal started out to be in the chorus, where I do all the vocal stuff, that was me showing a sax player what I wanted him to play. Oh, okay. And Barry Moran said, we won't be using a saxophone on this record. <laughs> I said, but that's what I was showing him with my voice. He goes, yeah, you showed him just perfect with your voice. That's the, that's the, the instrumental part. Oh, yeah. And it made all the difference in the world. In For the sure. Well, then the end, when you're just letting your voice just, just the emotion, the, 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 the yelps, the scream, it's like a wounded animal. It's just amazing. No words, just emotion. Just showing your soul to the world. It's amazing. Where did that really come from? You're just feeling the music and you just kind of let that out? You know, I had a hard childhood coming up and I had a hard life and I knew I was in, on to something with this song. And I just sang my guts out and left it all at the microphone. I didn't take anything away from it. I wow. left everything I had. It was a song I could sing every day. I thank God for my voice. It was, it was a great voice. And I was hurt by not being invited to participate in things like farm aid 
and concerts with multiple artists that I was never asked to per participate. And it, it, it bothered me. It, it made me feel like I was on the outside looking in. 16 years ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So I knew that my singing days were limited because I've lost the upper range of my voice and it breaks my heart. And there are times when if I didn't have a wife who is as wonderful as mine is and takes care of me, it'd be easier to check out than have to live day to day wondering if this is going to be a good day or is this going to be a Parkinson day. It's been hard to to deal with I used to be able to do anything with my voice. Oh, yeah. And I had a tremendous falsetto, and that's gone. Yet, when I walk on stage and I hear the crowd roar, it shoots me full of adrenaline, and it gives me the strength to do what I have to do. One day you wake up and you realize that the end is closer than the beginning. And you take stock of your life and you wonder if you made a difference. You wonder if you made a difference with some, some people in the world. And I like to think that I made a difference with Into the Night. Benny, I can tell you right now, you definitely made a difference. That's why we're sitting here because just an incredible, incredible song. Truly, I think, one of the greatest vocals ever put down to vinyl. And that's why it's so important to capture this with you, because we need to show this to the coming generation and the generation after that. It needs to live on, this song. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I met Sammy Kahn, the legendary Sammy Kahn. Oh, Kahn. yeah. Oh, yeah. I was at the president of NBC's home over in Hancock Park. And um, there was a dinner party, and Robert and I were there. And there were some great, great singers there that sat at the piano and sang songs. And I sat, Bobby sat at the piano and played, and we sang a couple songs, and the people went crazy. Wow. And then Sammy Kahn sits down and he goes, So I was sitting in my office and Frank Sinatra calls me and says, Sammy, I'm doing a movie called Three Coins in a Fountain. Or whatever the name of the movie was. Yeah. With Sophia Loren. And mm -hmm. I need a song. So I wrote, Three Coins in a Fountain. His yeah. singing voice was different than his talking voice. Yeah. He talked like a guy from Brooklyn, you know. Three coins in the fountain. And he goes, and then I met Gina Lola Brigida, and I wrote this, and he, he just went through a catalog of about oh. eight incredible songs. So I walked out on the porch, and I went to John Rohrbach's house, and I remember looking up at a full moon, thinking, I'm at the president of NBC's home, and I just heard Sammy Kahn do eight songs. <laughs> Lord, I love this life. I yeah. love this life. And he walks out to leave. And I said, what an honor it was to hear you sing. He said, young man, you are a singer. There are singers, and then there are singers. And he gives me a pat on the cheek, and he <laughs> goes, you're a singer. You keep it up. You're going to be world known. And I said, wow. thank you, Sammy. And I watched as he walked down the sidewalk with a full moon over his head, and there walked Sammy Kahn, who just endorsed me, sort of. And about a month later, he passed away. Gosh. We've lost so many great ones in music, especially over the last few years. And that's why sharing this history is so important. That's why I do what I do. That's why sharing these songs and these artists with our kids and their kids is, is so important. I really feel that we may never see artists and songs like these again. 
I hope I'm wrong, I really do. I gotta say is we love you, Benny, and your music and your legacy will be everlasting. Thank you so much.